My name is uh, Hjörtur Ákursson, and I work for the City of Reykjavik Department of Education and Youth. Um, <clears throat> I want to begin with uh, some general thanks. It will be a bit like an Oscar speech or, uh, or uh, an award speech, even though we're not getting any award. Uh, but first of all, uh, I would like to thank just the EA Grants uh, program for supporting this project uh, to make it possible for us to have this uh, exchange uh, between our uh, education systems. Uh, and of course, uh, thank the city of Lublin for contacting us and inviting us to be a part of this project. Uh, it has been uh, quite a challenge to get this project off the feet. I think it is uh, more than two years ago uh, that I was contacted first to see if we could participate in this project. But then we were in the midst of a, of a worldwide pandemic, which complicated, of course, traveling and all communication. And then when we thought we were out of the pandemic, a war broke out in your neighboring country in Ukraine, which of course complicated as well uh, the implementation of this project. So it has been a, a challenging uh, birth of the project. Uh, and it has meant that it has created a longer relationship between the two cities uh, in this cooperation. And since education is a relationship, I think that is very uh, proper to uh, commemorate. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who has participated in uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming us here in Lublin in the last two days. We have had a wonderful time during our, our partner meeting and meeting uh, schools and other institutions uh, in Lublin. We've gotten a good insight into the education system uh, in Lublin, in the City Hall in the first day. Uh, we also uh, visited one of your newest schools in School 58, where we saw very impressive facilities for sports and beautiful auditorium, and it was uh, quite an impressive uh, visit. Uh, we also saw very genuine artistic expression in uh, the Youth Cultural Center that same day. Uh, and then we also uh, got insight into the European Youth Capital uh, Venture of the City of Lublin now for the year 2023. Um, we went uh, on a wonderful visit to School 29 with very enthusiastic uh, administration uh, and a surprise TV interview as well, uh, which was... Uh, very fun, but in that school we also got to see an impact of the project, where the project had been impacting the school spaces uh, in the school, so this was wonderful uh, to see. And to the same extent, in uh, School 19 yesterday, we saw the impact of the project uh, on the school spaces already, so this was wonderful to get to see. And there we also got uh, to see how the, uh, the school had been impacted by their visit to Reykjavik uh, last year, where they had uh, uh, gotten the idea for uh, creating self-portraits of students, which they hung up on the wall, which is inspired by uh, Vastupaya School and Dalskoli from Reykjavik. So this was very nice to see already the, the impact uh, of the project. Um, so we are uh, starting here today with this uh, first panel for first part of the conference. We will uh, be introducing different aspects of the Reykjavik education system. I will start by giving you a bit of an overview of the Reykjavik education policy, uh, uh, what are the main tenets of the policy, how it came to be, and what we are doing to support the implementation of the policy. Uh, we will then get a presentation of uh, uh, how uh, maker spaces are used in uh, Vestibayaskoli school. We will get a presentation from uh, Olaf on uh, the link between health and education in the city of Reykjavik, uh, from Magdalena on uh, building cultural bridges uh, in Reykjavik. As was mentioned before, we have a large uh, Polish uh, minority in Iceland, which we are welcoming and integrating into our school system. And then we will end up with getting an introduction into uh, how Dalskoli in Iceland is working uh, with their students and linking that uh, to the project. But for me to start, since I don't have all of the time uh, in the world, um, my presentation is titled Let Our Dreams Come True, which is the, the tagline of the, uh, or name of the Reykjavik education policy. And it uh, encapsulates a lot of the ideology behind it in that uh, it is focused on the children that are attending our education system, that we should let their dreams come true. And this is very much the focus uh, of our education system, is on the children and 
making them equipped to realize their potential, their full potential through our uh, education system. But first, uh, a bit to situate where we are coming from and who we are. So we are coming from uh, Iceland, far up in the North Atlantic, as was said here before, kind of on the, on the, edge of, on the very edge of Europe. We have a population of uh, around 370,000 people, so it's close to the population of the city of Lublin, the whole country uh, of Iceland, just to also to give you an idea of the proportionality. Uh, our main language is Icelandic, and we have an immigration of about 15%. Uh, and I think close to or more than half of that is from Poland, which is by far our biggest uh, immigrant group uh, in Iceland. And the, the capital city of Iceland, Reykjavik, the only city in Iceland as well, um, has around 130,000 people. So it is about a third of the population living in the city. And then in the surrounding municipalities, so in the capital area, we have more than 200,000 people living. So almost two thirds of the country are living in that one corner uh, of the island. So uh, it's quite, a, uh, in a sense, a concentrated population uh, in that part of the country. Our education system in Iceland is similar, but not the same uh, as in Poland. So we have uh, preschools, which we call play schools uh, in Iceland, where children attend from the age of one or 18 months old to five years uh, old. And this is, uh, uh, seen as our first level of education in Iceland and in accordance to, to Icelandic law. So they start their education there at, at one years old or 18 months old. Then we have a 10 year compulsory school from uh, six to 16 years old. And then uh, secondary, upper secondary schools are uh, three years long. This changed a few years ago. This used to be four years long. So they would start university around 20 years old, but this was uh, reduced to three years. Uh, about uh, six years ago. And then from then on, uh, they can, of course, attend universities. Uh, and uh, in Iceland, uh, the municipalities, like the city of Reykjavik, are responsible for uh, management of policy making and running of the preschools and compulsory schools. So the upper secondary schools and the universities are run by the, by the central government. Uh, in Iceland and are not the responsibility of the, of the municipality. From what I understood in our first day here, this is a bit different uh, in Poland than in Lublin where you have uh, the upper secondary schools, the high schools run by the, by the local uh, government. Uh, in our education system, we have uh, around 22,000 children in the city of Reykjavik that we are uh, responsible for. And, uh, between 5,500 and 6,000 staff members uh, in, our, uh, in our preschools, schools, uh, leisure centers, which run after school activities and youth centers. Uh, we also have uh, school music bands, uh, adult education center, and then we support uh, kind of home daycare uh, individuals for children from, uh, from six or nine months of age to 18 months or two years old. Uh, and just to give you a bit of an overview of our uh, education system, uh, in the city of Reykjavik we are running 67 preschools uh, or play schools and then we have 17 independent uh, preschools that are run uh, most often by NGOs uh, in the city. Uh, and in total there are about uh, 5,300 children in our preschools and almost all children from the age of two years old have entered preschool, preschool and do go to preschool. And then we have uh, 38 compulsory schools or uh, schools for primary schools in the city of Reykjavik with uh, 14,600 students. And additionally, there are six independent uh, or private schools in the city of Reykjavik. But as you see from the numbers of students, we have uh, about uh, 90 or 95 percent of students go to public schools, and it is very a very common pathway through uh, education in the city of Reykjavik. The children start in their local preschool, and then once they finish their local preschool, they go to the primary school in their neighborhood closest to their home, and there they are continuing with the same children that they were in in the preschool, and then they uh, stay in that school until they finish, unless they move residents because they normally go to the school in their neighborhood. More than 90 or 95% of children go to their 
local public primary school. So it is very localized and uh, and uh, the kind of the general idea is that they have uh, these services or these opportunities close to their home so that they can go to uh, preschool and uh, primary school close to their home and maintain uh, a kind of local environment where they would also maybe attend uh, sports in that environment. And the same with uh, after school activities and youth centers. Since we run uh, the 37 after school uh, programs in the city and these are linked to the schools where we have children aged six to nine years old, but these are separate institutions. So they are not, uh, except in a few cases, run by the school themselves. They are normally separate entities that are run uh, either in or next to the school, but the principal is not the director of that institution. So they are uh, separate institutions. And I know from our visits here that you have um, in school support for students when the school day is either before it starts or after it finishes. So it would be a similar concept to that. But in Iceland, this is always in the afternoon since we do not have, um, we do not, as I heard, at least in two schools that we visited here, that you have kind of a double setting of students. So some students coming before 12 o'clock or one o'clock and the second set after in uh, Iceland and in, in Reykjavik. All students are uh, starting at 8.15 or 8.30 in the morning and then finishing at 1.30 to 2.30, depending on their age or, or the day. And these youngest group of students, six to nine years old then, has the opportunity to uh, attend after school activities, but these are optional and uh, parents pay a fee for the after school activities. So they're not um, part of the, the mandatory education or part of the school. And then for the uh, older children, aged 10 to 15 years old, we run uh, youth centers in the city of Reykjavik. Uh, these will normally have activities in the afternoon for the younger group of 10 to 12 years old, and then uh, evening openings for the 13 to 15 or 16 year old group, so for the teenage group. And as you see from the, the number of youth centers there, there are quite many because they are distributed around the city, close to uh, or in the neighborhoods where you would have schools that have this age group attending. And this is again uh, part of the idea that uh, these opportunities should be in the local area. So they have their, the, first their uh, preschool and then their primary school in their local neighborhood. And then within walking distance, they also have a youth center to attend in the evenings as part of the, their, uh, let's say, uh, outside school activities or, or non-formal uh, education. So uh, moving on to the Reykjavik education policy, Uh, it was initiated in uh, 2017 by the Reykjavik City Council, and it was a very vi wide political consensus to start this uh, policy development process. Uh, so all of the parties uh, in the local government agreed to, to start this process, and it's not always that all of the uh, local government uh, political parties agree on anything, so this is already uh, quite a feat that they uh, agreed on this. Uh, and the process was a very wide-ranging consultation process. The creation of the policy took uh, close to two years, and there were uh, two rounds of, um, of consultation. The first round uh, was collecting ideas from staff members within the teaching community or within the Department of Education and Youth, but also from children, from parents, uh, and from the general public, collecting ideas on what do we want to uh, see in our uh, education policy, what do we want the focus areas to be? And then those ideas were taken, and from that uh, we drafted uh, uh, the, the, the primary proposal for the policy, and then, then this was again sent out to the teachers, students, parents, and general public, which could then comment on, okay, what do we think of this draft? What do we think is missing? What do we think can be added to the policy? And uh, in the end, in this uh, policy-making process, there were close to 10,000 participants uh, that had, had a say in what the policy would be. And I know it's easy to listen to this and think, 
well, there were probably was no impact or that it didn't really, uh, didn't really matter. But I can, and I don't always tell this because it's, it feels like a crazy story. But when I, uh, in 2017 to 19, I was not working for the city of Reykjavik. And sometime in 2017, 18, when they had drafted the first proposal, uh, I went in there as, let's say, either a parent or as a member of the public. And in this online consultation, I commented that there should be more focus on international activities in education in the policy. And then when they released the final policy draft, they had included this in the policy. They created a new job for this person to develop international activities, and then they hired me for the job. <laughs> so through this uh, kind of policy recommendation, I created my own employment, uh, which also led to me being here today. So if it would not be for this, uh, for this kind of consultation process, we might not be here today. We would all just be somewhere else doing something completely different. Uh, so, uh, so for me, it's a very personal reason that this, uh, uh, that this process uh, was actually working. Uh, I don't know if it was only my uh, idea that made this happen, but I want to believe that I somewhat uh, created my own job there. Uh, but uh, during this uh, policy process, the question leading the work was what skills do we want our education system to have provided our children with uh, by the year 2030? Because this is the Reykjavik education policy until the year 2030, so it was looking more than 10 years into the future. And uh, we have very limited capacity to look 10 years into the future because the Time is changing quite rapidly. We do not know what exactly will be the needs in the future, but we still can, or at least wanted to attempt to, uh, define or find out what skills we need our education system to have provided children with in that time. And uh, many of those skills that, that we then, in the end, narrowed it down to are quite broad and open and kind of soft social skills because we see that those are the skills that are always needed, that our children always need once they enter into further education or once they enter into uh, the workplace. And it came very, became very clear uh, from early on in this process that we were both focusing on uh, formal education but also on non-formal education. And this is what we are working on uh, on one hand through our primary schools, but also through our after school activities, our youth centers, uh, where we have uh, pedagogues working, but working with different methods to develop the skills of our children. Because even though we are working, um, we are working uh, in, with different methods, we are still working with the same children just in different parts of the day or with the different methods, but our end uh, goal is the same, that we want uh, our children to benefit as much as possible and to become empowered out of our education system. Uh, in the end, the, the core vision of the policy is that children in, and youth engage in dynamic educational experiences in the city's schools and leisure centers that allow them to realize their dreams and to have a positive impact on society and the environment. So it is both internally on the children to realize their dreams, but also to have a positive impact on the community that they are growing up in and that they, are, uh, that they will then be working in and living in uh, once they grow up. Uh, the core skills of the, uh, that were defined in the policy and that we are working towards today are uh, social skills, uh, literacy, creativity, empowerment, and health. And uh, all of these core skills within the policy are seen from quite a broad perspective. So when we talk about literacy in the policy, we're not only talking about children being able to read and write in Icelandic, but also having literacy towards technology, having media literacy, being able to read their environment or their own uh, needs, and then social skills and, and empowerment that are quite closely linked in that children feel empowered to, to use the knowledge and skills that they have and to use the knowledge that they get through the education system and uh, and link that again to creativity, where they can use creativity not only 
in our uh, creative classes where they're working with art, but in all classes there is creativity. In all subjects in school there can be and should be creativity in how they are uh, presenting their work, how they're presenting the knowledge that they are gaining. And this is something that we are trying to implement and all of this in a way is additional to and added onto our national curriculum because of course we still have a national curriculum and this is very clearly defining study goals in different subjects and uh, but with these core skills we want to kind of find the core of our education system and where we want to have our uh, emphasis but uh, it is not enough to just create a policy and tell everyone now we have an education policy we have to follow up on that so there were uh, put into place actions to support the implementation uh, of this policy. One was creating the Center for Innovation in Education, which I belong to. Uh, some of that was getting new people to work for the city, like myself, on focusing on international projects. And the director of my uh, department, uh, Center for Education and Innovation, uh, to kind of lead the work and to maintain the focus on the policy. Because to create such a document and try to maintain focus on it for 10 years or 12 years is quite a is quite a challenge. Uh, but what we want to do with this is to develop this culture that supports innovation in education, that supports uh, teachers and administrators in schools to feel that they are allowed to and should be able to innovate in their education, in the techniques that they're using in their education, in the, in the ways that they are, they are focusing on and that they are uh, looking at the, the education system and the education of the child from one years old to 16 years old as a whole. Um, we also wanted to provide a platform for new projects and uh, created funding uh, to fund new projects within, uh, within the education department. I will tell you a bit about that on the next slide. Uh, we also created an online platform with a web page where we could have where we could display projects that have been funded and uh, that have been done, where we have uh, a toolbox for educators to use uh, in their education and uh, self-evaluation tools for our education institutions, uh, one of which uh, these evaluation tools, which is an online evaluation tools, gives uh, metrics and ideas on how to evaluate how you're doing with regards to health or creativity or these core activities, empowerment or uh, and such. Uh, we also put a big emphasis on supporting professional development. Uh, one of the ways in which we do that is by having a formal or formalized cooperation with the University of Iceland, their School of Education, where we have, uh, where we work with professors in the university to offer training courses that uh, are catered to the needs of our educators and uh, that kind of uh, their needs in, in terms of the focus of the activities, but also the times in which they are happening or if they can do things online or try to help them in their uh, professional development. But it's also uh, a, a relationship which is helping both parties, but because it also helps us or helps the university get into touch with practitioners to develop and support research for co-constructing new knowledge in the educational sector. So this was also uh, a big part of that uh, venture. And then uh, also we put international cooperation on the forefront by having uh, additional support for, um, for international projects. So uh, we developed or put into place uh, funding for innovation and development where we have uh, been supporting close to 200 projects uh, each year for the last four years. Uh, it's about 1.4 million euros annually, which is distributed to our schools. 70%, 75% of that is for smaller uh, projects that all uh, educational institutions uh, have a portion of in proportion to the number of students uh, that they have. And then 25% is for larger cooperative projects where more than one educational institution is working uh, together. And you might hear a bit about that from Vestabioskoli later where they have been collaborating with three schools on a three year long such uh, innovative project uh, which has been one of the, one of the better uh, kind of 
uh, types of these projects. Uh, but the, the idea with this is uh, not just creating a project that is perfect and everyone can use, but that to create this culture that encourages development and innovation. That implementation is a process, not a project. That we are creating this mindset of innovation that you should be and could be trying new things within, uh, within the schools and the education system. And also to build this trust to, uh, between administration and uh, teachers that, that they can be creative, that they can take risks, that it's okay to make mistakes because we are, that's the only way to develop is to learn through making mistakes. I have talked for too long. I am going to finish very soon. And just in the end, a bit of uh, self-boasting. So as part of this policy, we put the uh, international projects on the forefront. And uh, despite the very complicated COVID times, which have been smack in the middle of the last four years uh, and interrupted a lot of international projects, we had uh, in the years 2019 to 2022, we had uh, 24 international projects, and these are just the projects that have been kind of going through uh, my hands and our office. Those have been 18 Erasmus projects, both in the youth field and the education field. Uh, and then we have been involved in six EEA grants projects, this being, this being one of those uh, projects, uh, with a total of about 1.3 million euros in grants going to the city of Reykjavik for these. And, uh, and then, Additionally, at least 20 other schools in the city of Reykjavik have their own Erasmus or NordPlus projects, which is a Nordic uh, counterpart to Erasmus, uh, where they are uh, involved in their own school cooperation projects or student mobility projects. And then now, uh, this year and for the foreseeable future until 2027, we have now accreditation for both school projects and mobility projects centrally for the city of Reykjavik where we have, uh, let's say, somewhat guaranteed funding for uh, teacher mobility in our preschools and primary schools and youth worker mobility and youth exchanges in the youth field. So this has really helped us now to have, to integrate international activities as a part of our uh, kind of regular part of our business of the, our everyday schedule is that now we can send 60 to 90 teachers a year out for training courses or study visits. Uh, so we might use some of that funding to, to invite someone to Lublin uh, on job shadowing or study visit uh, to get to know you better. And now we have also started with some schools. Uh, now three schools have their own accreditation for, for student and staff mobility, which means that they are starting to have access to this funding on a regular or annual basis uh, without having the the, the very tedious Erasmus Plus uh, application procedure every year. So uh, this is something I really recommend looking into. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry for taking a few minutes too long. I hope uh, I can open up for some questions now, if you have any questions, but we might also be able to take some in the end. So any questions from the audience? If not, then we will. Uh, then you can collect all of your questions uh, until the end. Then, if we have some time in the end, we can address that. Uh, so then, I would uh, just uh, want to welcome uh, my colleagues from uh, Westerbaya School. Here, get us well. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Guðlaug Elisabeth Finnsdóttir and this is my colleague uh, Hrefna Birna Björnsdóttir. Uh, we are both teachers and we are in the administration team at our school at the moment. Uh, our school, Vestbær Skóli, uh, is a primary school for children in grades 1 to 7 in the uh, old quarter of Reykjavík. Uh, we are going to tell you about a uh, development project about makerspaces that was uh, and is still going on at our school in collaboration with two other schools in Reykjavik. Uh, the new education policy that Jörtur was talking about and explaining was a company with grants and schools could apply for the implement implement the policy with the emphasis on cooperation uh, between two or more schools. Uh, and an emphasis on one or more of its fundamental aspects, uh, social skills, self-empowerment, literacy, creativity, and, and health. 
Um, so, uh, in the spring of 2019, we applied together with two other schools in Reykjavik for grant to start uh, this development, uh, development project on makerspaces and technology on schoolwork. We called it the East and West or Öster Vestur project, uh, which is a reference to the locations of the schools in the city. Uh, we were lucky that a group of researchers from the University of Iceland's Faculty of Education formed a team to follow the project. And the research team sat in most of the meetings with us, giving us advice, support, and good suggestions, which in our opinion was invaluable. Uh, in the third year of the implementation, the project manager at our school, which was I, <laughs> conducted uh, an action research to support the change process, uh, reduce uncertainties, and ensure the perform uh, permanence of the changes. An action research is practical and specially uh, designed to connect field and theory in schools, and is a powerful way uh, in school development or reform work. So, with the development project, a line was drawn in the school's policy, and the participation of all teachers was assumed. By promoting cooperation and building a common understanding, it is uh, possible to increase the chances, chances that the reforms or the changes will be permanent. Uh, Vesterbær School has long emphasized on creati creative learning, creative thinking and initiative, and providing children with diverse opportunities for creativity and expression. At the school, arts and crafts are highly valued, and all children attend such classes weekly, as is customary in Iceland. Um, uh, but these are often textiles, uh, woodwork and design, visual arts, music, and domestic sciences. Uh, but why did we feel the need for more creativity and to go on a development project uh, about uh, makerspaces? Uh, the project focused, uh, focused on giving all students the opportunity to use their imagination, imagination and curiosity to find creative solutions and thus enhance their competences, uh, skills and knowledge in schoolwork not just in arts and crafts or theme work, but in all school work. We saw an exciting opportunity to meet the priorities of the education policy and the challenges of the 21st century in school work. The development project was our response uh, to a call for a modern and, and constructive school work that includes, uh, includes a change in mindset and uh, changing teaching methods where teachers develop their skills and abilities to give students uh, the opportunity to have a rich experience and be creative and active in their studies. Uh, one of our first projects uh, for the three schools was to hold joint educational camps. But this is one way of professional development and has been prominent in the professional development of teachers in Iceland in recent years. The aim of the ed educational camps is to share knowledge and experience on a peer basis, offer opportunities to try and adopt uh, innovations, strengthen networks, and have a conversation about career development, um, for example, technology. So, um, so what is a makerspace? When kids are making to demonstrate their learning, you have a makerspace. There are only three things that is needed in order for a makerspace to exist. It's kids, materials, and creativity. And we at West Bioscoli decided to develop a special space for the, for the work, workshop, as well as to integrate makerspaces projects into the whole school work. What we learned in this process is that makerspaces are not limited to one specific space or classroom and can be used through the school to make learning meaningful for children as they get to create and work with their hands. 
Makerspaces offer uh, integration and, and connections across subjects and such teaching methods make abstract phenomena tangible and meaningful and the learning more visual, visual as well as activating critical thinking, um, solution seeking and collaboration, which is very important. The participation of, uh, of all teachers in the project was expected, but um, by promoting cooperation and building a common understanding, it is, uh, yeah, as, as I said before, it's possible to increase the likelihood that the changes will be, be permanent. Um, uh, despite this, the project created a leadership of enthusiastic teachers who have been leaders in various areas, in various areas such as STEM teaching, the use of technology, innovation, and project-based learning. So, Hrefna, you are going to talk more about the makerspaces. <coughs> uh, next to the school library is the makerspace. It's a teaching space where you can assess various devices, tools, and materials. The makerspaces are registered art and workshops. Uh, the teachers and students can pick up and use in other spaces in the school as well. No, not, no one teacher takes care of the makerspace, <clears throat> so it's bound to be some chaos. But this is a work in process, and the, we are continuing to teach the children and the staff that everything has its place. We focus on having materials that are reusable and try to buy as little as, as possible. Teachers and parents <clears throat> bring material left from the homes to the makerspace where it is sorted. In the fifth or seventh grade, special innovation classes are taught in the makerspace, but innovation is a core activity in creating uh, where crea creativity does not take place in some kind. The children get to express themselves in designing things, learn new processes, and come up with ideas under guidance. We go through a process such as looking at what the problem is, what material is needed, how the idea works, and how to use the idea. What with the aim of improving the environment and the society. The changes that have taken place in society since the turn of the century are enormous, including the introduction of various smart devices in the last decade. The devices are integrated into daily lives of teachers and students, and the school must find ways to use technology in schoolwork in a constructive and educational way. We put special emphasis on information and technical education. It was suggested that technology be used for creative ways of working and new tasks that could not be done without it. Like making a video or a podcast instead, instead of writing an essay. We focused on the use of Google solution for students and teachers and creative apps such as Book Creator, iMovie, GarageBand, Chatterpix, and more. We give students the opportunity to try out all kinds of technologies that offer significant changes to assignment on every new thing that were previously unthinkable, such as making ordinary posters interactive with Makey Makey. Students learn to program and work creatively with Beepot, Osmo, Lego Vito, Lil Bits, Spiro, Das, and Microbit computers, Minecraft and Scratch, but it offers great possibilities to expand students' projects that may have been previously only been on paper. Now we just bought a laser cutter 
and we are very excited to see what it means for students' projects work. We got quite a few questions like, what is the importance of these devices and tools for teaching, other than just being a fun stuff? The answer is because such projects engage students and give them opportunity to influence their own learning. STEM or STEAM projects stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and art. Uh, <clears throat> we believe, it's believed that it can be appealed to even more students, since it's also uh, emphasis on design and creativity. The STEM projects <clears throat> are tackling various ideas and challenges on their own terms. The students were given STEM challenges both as special projects in the makerspace, such as making a balloon car, building a house for a wolf from famous fairy tale, a bed for Goldilocks and catapult. But also the children were given challenges in relation to themed projects, such as act challenge in relation to the theme of outer space. And to make lungs in a theme about the human body. Then various cooperative projects were carried out in selection, such as a skier, shoe design, and bridge construction. Before we embarked on this development project, an artistic approach was best found, and various project <coughs> disciplines and theme work. Most of the time, it was a teacher who made decisions about subject, set rules and standards, it was in, and was in charge during lessons. Some teachers had an, an artistic and creative focus in their teaching, and were excellent individuals, example of creative projects by enthusiastic persons. Design thinking and finding solutions strengthens the ability of teachers to organize and lead learning in makerspace projects. It arouses students' interest and causes them to find creative solutions. With us, it manifests itself in integrating learning, creative submissions, theme work, interest projects, and project-based learning where the children learn a wide range of subjects with the aim of solving them and gaining a deeper knowledge and understanding of them. For example, uh, children in the fourth grade were studying environmental education and the teacher saw an opportunity in discussing the effects of climate change and the ocean by learning about coral reefs and learning about underwater life. The result was a large creative makerspace project that tested students' various abilities. The students went on a virtual reality tour of a coral reef as a starter for the program. They created their own ecosystem, coral based on their own ideas and various materials. It was an artistic appeal to the nature. In the fifth and seventh grades, the theme was developed towards project-based learning where the children get to have a rich experience. The teachers <coughs> decided the theme and introduced their subject matter in a varied way. The children then get to choose something. Their interest to delve deeper into eventually present to others, and eventually present to others. In the seventh grade, the students were learning about the human body. They showed how to respond to a heart attack and discuss the causes of a heart attack, explained the differences between bloody types, showed the model of a heart and explained how it works, made a song with rhythm of the heartbeat, uh, made blood in various ways and explained this composition. They learned about bloodthirsty vampires, uh, wrote poems about love and much more. Some children used technology 
such as making video presentation in Google Slides, songs in GarageBand, while others create it with their own hands, such as making a heart and blood. A bit messy here. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm just going to wrap this up. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the, the project has received uh, attention, among other, and among, among other things, is it has been uh, presented in seminars and in conferences, and has been nominated for the Icelandic Education Award in the Group of Development Projects in, in 2021, and has been recognized by the Department of School and Recreation of the City of Reykjavik. Um, it can be said that the development plans in, educational, uh, in education in Iceland include uh, support for creativity and makerspaces, and uh, public debate focuses on creativity and schoolwork. We believe that the attention the project has attracted among Reykjavik's Department of School and Recreation and, and school staff is an indication that the society is interested in makerspaces um, and that they are considered um, supportive of student learning as they have activity options to prepare the children for the challenges of the future. Um, creative workshops um, cultivated with students' knowledge, skills and attitudes uh, help children become a critical, active and competent participants in modern society. They provide young people with the opportunity to be empowered and can increase uh, their commitment to change the society. It is so important that teachers are supportive and help them clarify their own thinking uh, because one idea can change the world. So uh, that's the end of our uh, <laughs> thank you. End of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, so if you if you have any questions, maybe we can answer them. Um, but also later maybe. Yeah. Also later. Yes. Also during conversation later, if you have, yeah. you can always approach us to. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I think we should use the next 15 seconds to stand up and twist a little bit. Okay? Stand up. Just twist a little bit. Oh, boy, that felt good to get the blood flowing. So, this is what we as teachers must do with our students. They can't sit all the time and just listen to us. So we need to do this. But uh, my name is Olaf, and I am working as a project manager of assessment and public health within the Department of Education and Youth. And uh, I'm going to run really quickly just through uh, the public health and the public health policy of, of Reykjavik, and then how it combines to our education policy, and then a little bit uh, sneak peek into social skills that are really important, as has been stressed here this morning. It's all about social skills. Really, it is. So this is uh, my absolute favorite picture of 
what uh, public health look like. This is uh, health in the river of life and what we need to do to keep people healthy and well. And as you can see, we need to start upstream, up the river to, with the promotion. We have to teach our children how to swim and us as well as adults. We, we have to know how to swim to survive in a river. Uh, sometimes we, use, we have to have life vests. Somebody needs that. And also we have a net that is in healthcare to prevent people from going down the waterfall. But sometimes it feels like we are wading down the waterfall to catch people. And that is actually too late. Of course, some, we go there eventually, but still, we can prevent people from going down that waterfall at early age. So, and as you can see, uh, at, uh, we are, it says, the slide says actually cost. But I say, if we start early, if we start by teaching people how to swim, this is an investment. Its researchers have shown again and again that every slotty, every euro, every krona you invest in health promotion and prevention, it comes back at least five times. Uh, you get, yeah, get the return at least five times later on in the social system, judicial system, uh, and yeah. So I don't know why we are often waiting down by the waterfall. We are supposed to be upstream. There we can do great things. And just a little bit about our framework. We actually had uh, a public health policy uh, for the first time in 2021. And uh, we are a part of uh, healthy cities in Europe that is organized by the World Health Organization. Uh, we are a health promoting city that is uh, uh, an approach, that is, a holistic approach that is originated with the uh, Directorate of Health in Iceland. And they are working on this with municipalities, with the uh, NGOs and so on to create healthy communities. And it's uh, really nice to say because I was not working for the Reykjavik municipality at the time. But uh, when this project of healthy cities started or healthy communities in Iceland, uh, I live in the first uh, community that was healthy community, but now we have more than 95% of Icelanders living in a healthy community. And that is uh, quite a victory in itself. Uh, and then it's the public health policy and the influencing factors on our health. And as you can see this uh, rainbow over there, uh, it's us in, in the middle, of course, uh, we are, of course, uh, as individuals, uh, we are responsible for our uh, attitudes and behavior and our choices, but still our communities can help us in such a great way because every setup, like our schools, for instance, they help us making easy, uh, healthy choices. We have to make the healthy choice the easy choice. So communities have also great responsibility in, in the matter. And as you can see, if you look at the yellow bow, that's what we can do. It's uh, uh, phys being physically active, eat well. Uh, uh, we have to sleep enough to feel healthy. But then if you go to the honest one, that is our family, our friendship, and our social connections with other people. And if you go to the red, uh, red bow, then this is uh, employment, housing, uh, water, social services, sports. And if you go to the broader, broadest uh, aspect, then it's this, uh, the policy and, uh, of the governments, of, of local governments, uh, the schools, uh, and so on. So you can see we're all a part of a really big picture and everything has to uh, work together to make us feel healthy and, and well. Uh, 
And our policy, public health policy, is also based on uh, the green plan that uh, has to do with sustainability within our city. We also have a food policy, and uh, in the school perspective, that is to provide our children with healthy and nutritious food in school. And that alone, if they are uh, well fed, that alone can, uh, then they behave better, they feel better, the social skills are better, the communication is better. So we can actually solve a lot of things by having good food in our schools. And I know you have. We have experienced <laughs> Uh, very good food and, and a lot of it. <laughs> uh, and then we have our very important educational policy as well, because that uh, all this works together. And we have to have health in all policies. It doesn't matter which policy we are making within our governments or local communities, we have to have the health goggles on every time because every decision we make that affects us as individuals and our health in some way. Uh, those are the main objectives of our public health policy, and that is, of course, we have to look at people in all stages in life, all ages. Uh, we have to have the equality for health and well-being. We can't leave anyone behind. And then we want, of course, health and well-being to guide us through everything, to be this health in all policies that I was talking about. And what is very important is that we have to use evidence-based knowledge and best practice at each point in time. Because we can do a lot of things, and if we don't know how they affect people, we could even do just something worse. So there are a lot of uh, researches that we, we can rely on, so we should use them. Uh, I don't expect you to understand this because this slide is in, in Icelandic, but this is just how to show you how we combine those three main objectives of our public health policy to the sustain, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And that is so great when you can find all kinds of uh, policies and uh, mix them together, because they really support each other. And then a little bit about uh, public health through our education policy. Uh, you've seen this before. Those are the five, four skills that our education policy emphasizes. And as a public health specialist, as well as a teacher, I say, of course, health is the most important thing. Because if you are not feeling well, no education takes place. You can't learn. But then again, uh, education is also uh, really important for health. So it, uh, yeah, so it intervenes with each other. And you've shown the, seen this also before. That is actually what we want to do with your education policy to let the children's dreams come true. And that is a really, really inspiring goal and a vision for an education policy. But it's, it's difficult to do this, it is. But still we have a lot of good things going on, but we can always do better. And that's why uh, and collaboration with you in Lublin, in Lublin is really, really important because we can learn from you, and hopefully we will also teach you some things. Uh, and what we want to do is that all our um, uh, kindergartens, primary schools, and youth work will be health promoting by the year 2025. We are well on our way. Uh, and we are emphasizing now uh, on mental well-being, that is, uh, also, it's very important all the time, but maybe even more so now after COVID. Uh, social skills and empowerment, really important. And then sleep, that is something that uh, we are really focusing on now with our teenagers, mostly uh, the 15 years old, because uh, teenagers from just from nature, they are they are lacking some sleep. I don't know how it is here. Is it the same here? Do they sleep, not sleep enough? Okay, I think it's a global problem. 
But we uh, open and off. We have to. We are at, we are on the wrong time set. I don't know. Yeah, can you say that? Yeah, compared to the sun, we are actually on a wrong time set, and the government they just refuse to change it. So we will have to work on that, and of course, prevention for uh, alcohol, drugs, cigarettes. That's a constant battle. Climate change is something that our children are very aware of, and they demand that we do something about it. So of course we do, because it's a global problem as well. And then the nutritious food in school. Uh, and what is important is that uh, to keep in mind is that everything that we pay attention to, that will grow and thrive. So we have to be focusing on the right things, be positive and be solution oriented. That's how we succeed. Uh, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about our laser cards. Uh, that is actually, that was launched back in 2007, and that is a, gr a laser grant that every child in Reykjavik gets once a year. Uh, and the, pur the purpose is that all the children from the age of 6 to 18, they can use that to take uh, part in, uh, in some sort of a club activity. It can be sports club, uh, circus seminars, uh, language school, music, and so on. And uh, the amount from 2007 has, has risen, as you can see, but you also maybe can see that the year 2023 is missing. But they actually uh, have, uh, there are more money now. It's about 2,200 slotty that each child gets per year to use for this, and the laser card can also be used for after schools program. So we are really trying to get every child to be active and be social within some sort of a club. Uh, we make contracts with all the uh, clubs that can be, so uh, there are some strict rules, but there are a few of them. It has to be a club, they have to have a trainer that is at least 18 years old and with appropriate uh, education to do what they are supposed to do. Uh, they have to have approved housing as well. And the course has to be at least eight weeks long. And uh, from the beginning, from 2007, we have made contracts with uh, about 300 clubs. But now we have about 150 active contracts. So our children have a lot to choose from. Uh, we follow uh, the usage of this laser card. So here you can see uh, by age groups and boys and girls how they are using it. And you can see in the uh, youngest age group from the six to nine, there is more usage than in the oldest age group from 16 to 18. And uh, boys and girls, it seemed it's very similar. But then again, we can also monitor the usage of this laser card by districts within Reykjavik, the post postal codes. And as you can see in, in uh, district 111, there is less usage. Uh, and that is actually the district in Reykjavik where we have most immigrants living. So we have to figure out what it is. Is it cultural differences? Is it that uh, parents and, and students don't know about this laser card, or what is it? So we can monitor this. And this has actually changed, uh, changed a lot within the organizations. We have better information for both parents and students, and uh, they can seek for information in, in one web portal, so it's easy for people to to familiarize themselves with what is, uh, what is uh, on offer. And just a sneak peek into three, I want to tell you about uh, three very uh, good uh, social skills uh, uh, projects that our schools have. And that is this first one that is in one school in Reykjavik. Uh, it, it's the guiding light or, or this beacon. 
And that is uh, a project that uh, goes from the first grade, from six years up to uh, 16 years old. And uh, they have a lot of uh, projects within the project that maybe everybody that is uh, six years old, uh, they get one project. And next year, they go to another. So it's uh, the build up on what they have already gone through. So we use, for instance, Sippy's Friends. Do you know that here, the Sippy's Friends? Great. And they have a relationship service uh, within uh, classes. Uh, and then art, you probably know that as well. Yes, wonderful. And uh, active team building activities as well. And like I said, that every student goes to the whole program. So the, uh, at the end of the 10 years of compulsory school, they are at the top of the beacon, just the light. Uh, then is the friendship project. That is uh, actually uh, originated in Norway. Uh, and that is designed because in, in Iceland, every child goes outside to play during recess in school. And uh, there we have some uh, friends that have been chosen as friends in each class, and they are responsible for uh, having some organized games and so on in the, uh, in the school grounds, and see to it that no one is left behind, that everybody takes part in it. Uh, and that has actually pr proven to be very positive. The outcome is very positive of uh, carrying out this project. Uh, the main goals are better friendship and, and social skills. And of course, to get the children to, bo to bo be more physically active. Uh, and then, not the least, the training of positive leaders. And I can just tell you a, a personal story that I have twins that are uh, 14 years old now. Uh, one of them is just, yeah, you don't need to worry about him. But the other one is, I often refer to him as a little flower. He's delicate and he's lacking some self-esteem. And he was actually chosen to be this leader, to be a friend, to organize games uh, during recess. and. The change in the child, he went from this to just, he was so happy, he felt responsible, and it just did wonders for his self-esteem. And we also, can you uh, take negative leaders, you know all those, and it, we can have turned them into positive leaders because they have this responsibility, and they actually rise to it. So it's, uh, it's amazing, amazing tool. And of course, prevention of, of bullying. And uh, lastly, uh, coaching. That is uh, something that is uh, quite new within our schools. But we have one school that has been coaching the 10th graders or the uh, 15 years old. And that has then been about learning objectives, that they learn to set goals and uh, talk about how they're feeling and, uh, yeah, and what they want to do. And that has actually, yeah, that has made wonders. And like, for instance, just on the well-being and how the children feel, because they have uh, done research before and after those coaching interviews. They get three coaching interviews during the winter. And there are numbers such as 95% uh, of boys, they feel better at school. And we were just, wow. And this is actually just the question of speaking to the children and listen to them. Focusing on the, what they're saying, not s telling them what to do all the time. And yeah, like I say, uh, among benefits, uh, they feel better, they are better in control. And of course, that leads to better behavior, better communication, and so on. So I, I, I'm a coach as well, so I say we have to do this all around the world. But we have to start someplace. And uh, like I said earlier, it's really important for all of us to work together. So we are really thankful to all of us from Iceland, really thankful for being able to be here and work with you and we learn from each other, because nobody has all the answers, and that's why we need each other.
And don't forget, cooperation is always the key to success. So thank you so much. Many, many thanks. I'll be speaking in, uh, in English, so I would like to ask my colleagues from uh, Iceland to use the interpreting set. My name is Magdalena Elizabeth Andres-Dotir. I, I, I work as a Polish speaking mediator uh, uh, with the municipal office in Reykjavik, uh, what we call Literacy Center. I wish to thank you in the first place. It's a great honor for me to be here. I feel a deja vu about 30 years ago. I was facing an examination board in my high school before my, my Polish exam, so I, I feel more or less the same way as 30 years ago. So if there are any Polish teachers here, pardon me for my slip-ups and mistakes. So I'm, I'm really more nervous than during my final exams at high school, trust me. I hope you will not grade me badly for that. Uh, uh. A więc to jest nasz zespół. This is the team I work with. Oferuje nauczycielom, przede wszystkim nauczycielom. What we do, we offer teachers different training sessions, lectures, meetings where teachers zagubieni lub who may feel a bit lost or struggle with certain students or, or experience some, some doubts or uncertainties, they can come and talk to us. We also have mediators or mediator work. I'll tell you in detail about this in a moment. These are my, my, my friends, my colleagues. They can't be here with us. We have uh, 12 people on board, three mediators, the rest of them are speech therapists, different experts who work directly with schools. As it says here, our Center of Language and Literacy offers courses, trainings, lectures, uh, small group meetings, coachings for teachers, in class, outside class, workshop sessions targeting specific teaching uh, methods and mediator work. So every school, every teacher can be in touch with us, with professionals, and in most cases, the school, if, if it has a project, and they invite us to come and, and assist in uh, communication, for example, between a teacher and, and parents or children. We take part, our mediators take part in it. So it's really interesting. I have my workshop tomorrow, so if you're interested, join me and, and you will learn more. But now going back to my or our work in Iceland. So what does a mediator do? Well, we build bridges, bridges between cultures, between languages. Why do we call ourselves mediators in, in the, the Icelandic, Icelandic language? There is this component of bridge and, and carpenter or joiner. So we join, we build bridges between teachers, parents and children. So the first two people who started to work as mediators was myself and my colleague Chrysel. And we have a um, Ukrainian national uh, with us who is a mediator as well because we have more Ukrainian uh, population and we have a colleague who speaks Arabic uh, languages or Kurdish and he can communicate with parents and children from those from this this part of, of the world so our role primarily 
is to help communicate with teachers and parents. We inform parents about their rights, about their responsibilities. We speak about the overarching goals and objectives that schools must meet. We talk about multiculturalism, multilingualism. We talk about the relevance of, of your mother tongue. We talk about uh, the Icelandic education system. So this is all that we uh, provide to those who want to uh, listen. Uh, I think my colleagues from this municipal office of Reykjavik showed you some statistics, but I also have a few figures for you before I move on to some other inspirations. So uh, when you scan this code, you will see all data figures from Reykjavik that you might be interested in. But Hörte, I think uh, he didn't tell you that much about Darkfredler, which is a nursery institution, but this is not exactly what you think it is. This is a system where you can leave a child at some self-employed parents, some kind of day carers. These might be teachers or people who have gone through a specialist course designed by, by our municipal office. About 450 children are part of this, of this nursery system. And this is before the child can uh, go move on to to, kind to a kindergarten. Then we have kindergartens, we have a kind of day camps, and uh, usually during the summertime. And we have music schools. So now a few 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 figures from my work. You can see the language diversity of our students in uh, Reykjavik. As you can see, the Polish kids are on the top of the list. These kids, many of these kids uh, were also born in, uh, in Iceland. So these are both those who came to Iceland and those who were born there. And this group grows from year to year. Uh, and these figures show you why mediators are so important in our system. Again, uh, a little chart of uh, what our system looks like. This is what the colleagues spoke about before. We have, uh, of course, all the levels of institutions, and you can see where the municipal council is responsible for what and and the ministry. So these uh, videos have uh, uh, dubbing in different languages. When you scan it, you can you can learn about our system. We have one in Polish. Can we play it, perhaps? The film has about five minutes. Okay, I can see thumbs up, so we can we can watch and listen. So can I ask uh, the technicians? at the back of the room to start this video. I mean, the one in the Polish language. Okay. No, you can't. You can't play it. All right. Well, you can scan the code and watch it yourself, uh, or you can do it online uh, if you get hold of this presentation. A presentacja nie będzie później dostępna? Tak, okay, to będzie dostępna prezentacja na Sorry, I cannot hear what the people say, but I, I suppose these PowerPoints will be available on the website, on the conference website, so you'll be able to watch any time later on. So all kids uh, in Iceland need to attend school obligatorily uh, up to grade 10. Later on, they move to high school and university if they want it. In Reykjavik, 97% of children last year, aged, aged 3, 4, they started kindergarten. So they're, they're going to move on to elementary school later on. Our school year starts uh, on the 20th of August, ends 
in June, it's 190 days to be precise, and in spring, every school publishes um, a calendar, school calendar for the next school year. Elementary schools, I mean, the, the, the compulsory education component, um, schools are, um, are free of charge. What does it mean, free of charge? Uh, it doesn't mean parents don't pay the fee. Well, indeed, the school in Iceland, at least up to the municipal level, the school provides kids with all the starter kit. I mean, pencil case, books, course books, pencils, pens, erasers, everything. So parents don't pay anything. The only thing the parents should provide is healthy breakfast. Some fruit or some snack, yogurt, sugar-free preferably, or some healthy sandwich. So in every school in Iceland, because some children are allergic, it is forbidden to bring uh, products including uh, nuts, including peanuts, or anything that might be considered uh, dangerous to, to children uh, with such, such allergic problems. So we have uh, elementary school divided into three components. The youngest children from class, from grades one to four, they spend about 20 hours a week at school, then grade five to seven, 23 hours a week, and youth eight to 10 grades, they spend about 25 hours at school every week. So, so the three types of schools are most popular. The school that has all the grades in it, from 1 to 10. Then we have schools 8 to 10 grade. And sometimes one district has three schools where there are grades 1 to 10 and grades 8 to uh, 10. So usually the youth attends a different facility than the youngest kids. So, and what we sometimes communicate to parents is what we call social promotion. Well, I have coined this expression myself. Uh, it came from, from social promotion in English. It's not so popular in Polish. It came from Canada and the United States. So, uh, in other words, uh, kids who attend the same grade are usually of the same age, but not necessarily in Iceland. Kids who were absent too much or did not master a certain material, they will not be promoted to an upper grade. Uh, the grading system, uh, we have letters, unlike in Poland, where you have numbers from 1 to 6. We have A, B+, plus, uh, B, these are the best grades. But elementary schools spełnić warunki, aby przejść do następnej klasy. Także mi się wydaje, i They need to meet specific conditions to be promoted, and we have numbers from 10 to 1, where uh, 10 is the best grade. Anyway, we always try to show the parents how the system works, because parents from uh, continental Europe, they think that if a child is promoted up to an, another grade, they believe that the child has mastered certain material, but it's not always the case. This national educational program, it mentions uh, rights and obligations of parents, uh, among other things. According to uh, educational law, it says parents are responsible for their children's education. So parents, they, particularly if they come from a foreign country, they sometimes say they don't speak Icelandic, so they can't help their kids in uh, homeworks. 
or, or, or learning, which is not always true, but that's why we sometimes intervene so if a school has a problem, they invite mediators and we try to explain such parents how they can be helpful, how they can assist their children in uh, different school works, even though they don't speak fluent Icelandic. And this law also mentions promotion of uh, uh, healthy lifestyle and well-being at school, like my colleague said. In every school, there is great pressure on creating a, a realistic picture, so to say, of a student. Every student should be, should be self-assured, should believe in their own skills and abilities, should know their goals, and much pressure is also on physical exercise and promotion of healthy lifestyle. Uh, there is also here uh, a few words about uh, resting, about leisure, because, well, we all struggle with this. Uh, we complain about lack of time and that children overuse technology. They have not enough rest. So you can see uh, Icelandic law even regulates that aspect. Besides, we have good communication, hygiene, uh, healthy or on uh, rational ed sexual education, understanding your own and other people's emotions. So this is where the pressure goes in Icelandic school. And we know, we all agree, school is not only about learning and teaching, it's what we call second home. Or for some students, uh, it's even the first home. Uh, we have uh, just heard about the, the leisure card for kids and youth. Uh, I don't want to repeat that. But it's very important to keep in mind this, this card is valid from the age of 6 up to 18. So, if the child graduates uh, at the age of 16, they can keep using this card until they are 18, uh, while they are at high school. So whether they want to go to a gym or, or, or a club or some other entertainment, they can they can use it. And as my colleague, uh, she had she had even tr converted the price into the police lotis. But anyway, uh, it's about 75,000 Icelandic crowns. So if my son attends uh, football classes, the card was enough to pay for classes from the, from the beginning of the year until, I think, s September, and I had to pay extra for the remaining classes until December. Generally, children or kids in Iceland there is a great difference here between the kids there and in Poland or elsewhere. I mean, children can go to work. In grades 8, 9 and 10, children can apply for work. And the authorities, they secure such work for them. They work in the summertime, so the parent applies for, for this work on behalf of the child and up from grade 8, children can work also at um, uh, private businesses. But if they can find, can, can find employment or summer, summer job uh, in a private company, they go to the municipality and they will find a job for them. How much they are paid, how much are they paid for that summer job or per month? Do you know some, some average pay? Yeah, like uh, for three weeks is three four hundred euros, you know. Przepraszam bardzo, jak. To jest ta matura ustna. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Remember, I'm I'm still at high school doing my final exams. 
Sorry for that. Yeah, it's between three and four hundred euro. godziny, tak jak powiedziałam, uczeń nie może dłużej pracować. Chyba, że jest w This is this is uh, up to three, four weeks. And what 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 kind of job do they do? Well, they uh, remove, uh, for example, uh, weed from f public spaces. They uh, clean. They also can work at a zoo, feeding animals or cleaning. And the oldest ones, the 10 graders, they can even work at preschool institutions. It's a great chance for, for them to integrate with little kids. They, of course, they don't take care of, of children directly, but they, they assist teachers at uh, preschool establishments. As regards inspirations and recommendations, Reykjavik is known as uh, the city of literature. It was named so by UNESCO. So it has a great uh, role and a challenge to promote literature among um, its citizens and beyond. And uh, it's relatively easy to publish a book in Iceland. So I can say that almost every Icelander has published some book, whether about cooking or sports or anything. So we do publish a lot. And 10 graders have programs in, in certain schools where they are, the kids are invited to write their own book. In one of the programs that my son attended, they penned a, a cooking book together with his friends. They published it online, but it's also published in, uh, in uh, black and white as paperback. All parents, of course, purchased it. They have uh, some recipes that are no longer so popular, so the kids, they had to talk to their parents, grandparents, about some old recipes, and it's a great collection of, of uh, cooking recipes. So lit lit literature is a, is a very important thing for Icelanders. And giving a book as a present for birthday, as a Christmas gift, there is always a book. The book is the best choice. And if, uh, even if Santa Claus comes to kindergartens, he would give away books to, to the kids. And nobody complains about that. So the most important thing for a child, I think, is support they get from, from parents, all of have told you that, but also from teachers at school, because we are models to follow. You know, we teach children how to take responsibility for their freedom, for their free choices. And teachers basically trust that children should be able to do a project on their own. The teachers usually stand by, of course they help if needed, but they give children a lot of room, a lot of freedom to choose what to do. And we also, uh, we have this, this approach that uh, we don't require children to say good morning, uh, we are the first to say good morning. Uh, we don't require children to pick uh, rubbish from the floor. We pick rubbish from the floor to set a model, to set a pattern. Um, and we don't... Okay, we, we call ourselves by the first name, I mean the teachers, the, the teaching body, whether you are a professor or director or just a regular teacher, we call ourselves by the first name. And kids also uh, even though the kids are also allowed to do so uh, they still we teach them to show respect so whatever name you call someone with the first or last there's more beyond that respect is really given a great priority respect and trust at school so respect of children is something very relevant uh, there are no grades or assessments for conduct for behavior at school so 
regardless of how a student behaves, they're not assessed for that, they don't have a grade for that, as it is in Poland. Poland. It's when you want to deal with such a thing, with, with a messy child, you talk to parents. You talk to parents, you talk to the child to help the child change. change. If it doesn't work, then we turn to other institutions, we turn to the municipality or to external advisors. There are also uh, parents' councils. Every school has such a parent council. And there is also an association of teachers, of, of parents, of elementary school children. You can, you can visit this website, and, and there is also a lot of information in Polish. So these associations, they have their own websites that are multilingual, uh, so one for elementary school, one for preschool, parents, the websites have a lot of materials, pieces of advice, uh, recommendations, how to deal with teachers how to communicate effectively with kids. So have a look at these websites. This content is really worth uh, your while. And it's in Polish too. And as uh, the colleagues mentioned, we work with universities. In particular, our, our center does it. We organize training workshops uh, um, for teachers, for parents, and we always rely on academic uh, research, on academic writing. And particularly, there's one professor doing uh, great research, because this is some kind of a signpost for us, a reference point for us before we decide which way we go, how to improve certain things, or what to improve for better. And me and my colleague, Kristen, we are members of um, the so-called PEACH initiative, uh, it's for promotion of, of multilingualism, of um, promotion of um, teacher, parent, children, parent relationships. We have researchers from, from all over Europe, from Canada, excuse me, just one minute left. And again, have a look at these. You can read the content in Polish. Many people come together, visit the website to find solutions, find answers um, on how to help their children. Again, some more research from Iceland, um, preschoolers, uh, school children, parents from different cultures, different backgrounds. Uh, all these uh, outcomes are published in English. So please, feel encouraged to read. And now, this, this code is for your feedback, so please take a picture and fill in the quick, uh, quick survey because you would like to hear your opinion about this uh, presentation. Well, no Wi-Fi, you're out of range, everyone. Okay, so those of you who can do it, please do it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, seems like somebody knows the password to the Wi-Fi. It's Arche 300. Okay, any questions? I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear this answer because the lady wasn't speaking to the microphone.
Ja. Przede wszystkim, tak jak o... Okay. Przede wszystkim pierwszym, pierwszą taką zasadą to jest współpraca z rodzicami. Well, the first thing is working with parents. We have lectures about that. Uh, intended for teachers and parents, how to identify uh, different cases, and we have also training for children in class. And we have this uh, leisure card, because before that, uh, children did not basically attend any um, extracurricular classes, so the leisure card really helped children find what they were interested in, what, what is their favorite pastime. I, I'm ho I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, I must say that in our social media, sometimes they publish materials about Iceland, about how Iceland deals with addictions, with uh, testing psychoactive substances, and it's a great uh, challenge, of course, including in Poland. We are experiencing a major crisis of mental health among the youth. To a large extent, this may be attributed to the pandemic, but also to, to constant changes, including political changes in the country and changes to the educational system. Well, thank you. Any more questions? And please speak to the microphone. 15 minut jeszcze. Prezentacja. Mm -hmm. Także pytania też będzie można podać. E, przyjść do nas, proszę się nie bać. Well, you can always approach us. If you can see me, I can help you with translation. If you want to talk to some of the colleagues from Iceland over coffee or lunch. So feel, feel free to, to talk to us anytime. Thank you. My name is Johanna Guðbrandsdóttir and we are from Dalskóli. Dalskóli is a second, lower secondary school in the outskirts of Reykjavík. It was founded in the year 2010, but back then, Dalskóli was just a small country school. And the departments, the kindergarten department and the primary school department, were not connected together. But today, as Dalskóli is a growing school, uh, we have all the departments connected together. And I wanted to tell you that uh, first, when I started teaching, um, I was just teaching in a movable classroom. Um, it was strange, but, you know, uh, it's all about the teacher. Of course, uh, the environment and the building is important, but you can make magic even though you are in a movable classroom, if you understand me. So it's a huge change now. We have this beautiful new designed school building with endless possibilities. And of course, uh, it's uh, more fun, but uh, Dalskóli is always Dalskóli, even when we, when we were just a small country school. And today, with this uh, beautiful design school building, um, our heart is always uh, where we belong, uh, with the children, and what we can do as teachers, and the connections uh, with the teachers and the students. That's the most, most important. Yeah? So today we have grown up to 450 uh, children and we are one of, the, one of the biggest schools in Reykjavik. And we offer children from uh, 12 months old to 16 years old uh, to stay with us. And we have all the departments, three departments connected together. And that's our strength. We have the kindergarten department and the lower secondary school department and the laser department connected together. We hold hand in hand. We play together, we think together, and we work together. 
And I would recommend that, you know, in every country as a school building, you know. School community. Yeah, to have this whole school community. This is our logo, and it stands for that happiness is a journey. And here you can see the three figures together. We hold hand to hand. And I told you about how we are connected together. And there was the design bit. Yeah, the dance part. Okay. In Dalskoli, uh, we teach by the formative assess model by Shirley Clark. And um, the model uh, shows that um, feedback is really important. That's a key. Feedback between a teacher and student, feedback between peers, and we want a discussion in the schoolroom. We want to have talk partners, and uh, we want goals and steps how to reach goals to be displayed and clear. And we think that this leads to a strong learning culture. And as long as uh, formative assessment, uh, we use growth mindset, which uh, empower children and uh, helps with uh, resiliency and problem-solving mind. And we see, see mistakes, are, mistakes are seen as okay. It's just uh, a way to improve. And um, in Dalskole, we use uh, positive discipline because we think that kindness is the most effective way to guide a child. Um, as you have heard, in Iceland, um, handcrafting is really important. It's all about handcrafting and creativity. So we call our handcrafting lessons love because it's actually the most fa favorite lesson of every child. So the name love is really appropriate. And handcrafting, handcrafting in Dalskole is textile, artwork, uh, home economics, cooking and baking, and woodwork. And because we want to practice social skills a lot through play, outdoor activity, in the classrooms, uh, we have these annual games that take place in May every year. And we have a lot of fun together. We come together uh, as the whole school uh, from six years old to 16 years old. Even the kindergarten department takes place in their way. And we group together and we practice social skills, problem-solving problem mind, and we go through obstacles games together. And, and it helps uh, every child to belong and to get to know all the children in the school. And we call it the games of wolves. Uh, the, na the names uh, takes place from our neighborhood. That is called the volley of wolves. And as you have heard, democracy is really important in Iceland. And we have a children uh, assembly every year where children can tell their opinion, um, they are listened to, and they can actually change things. They have the possibility to have a saying about how things work in school, and this is really important. So now my colleague is going to continue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I am a kindergarten teacher. So my name is Solveig, and I have been working in Dalskola since the school start. And then it was a really small neighborhood, but they have been growing a lot. And now we are, I'm going to tell you a little bit how we work together. Um, because we have a five, we have four and five years old in the primary school, so we work together one times in the week, and then we have the kids from the first class coming into the kindergarten, and we mix them together, and they are coming to play, and the kids are going to the laser department and the first grade. So all the teachers are working together. And they are all our children, so we mix them together. They're going to meet their old friends, and they're going to come to play, and they are staying in the classroom. And yeah, there's a lots of fun. So we have 
80 kids two weeks <laughs> up. And we were, oh my God, how, what, what are you going to do with? So we write a number on their hands. Yeah. So we split them up to the groups, and they were so proud. Oh, I'm number one. I go into this classroom. So and after a little bit, we didn't have to do that. But we were thinking about first time when we have the so many together, how we's gonna first figure out they are not gonna get lost in the school. Yeah. <laughs> but they all work out. <clears throat> This is more average. I think I told you about that. We work together. Yeah. And this is, yeah, this is the, in the kindergarten, yeah. Um, we have a kindergarten teacher and we also have assistants. But we, we work together as a team with the kids and we are always talking about it's so important to be on the floor and listen to their voice and see what they are doing when they are playing. They're not only playing, they are talking about stuff and then we learn about them. We see what they're interesting and we work with that. <laughs> yeah, and we, yeah, and the next, we want everybody to feel good and we want everybody's voice to be heard. And this is really important to listen to them. They're outside. We're always telling the new people, <clears throat> you have to be there. You have to listen. You have to listen what they're talking about. You have to be, this, this is a really important job. This is our most important job in the world, to be with these young kids. You're helping them to be growing and be a person. You learn it so early. So it's so important to stay with them and, and have them seen. Everybody have a voice. Somebody are shy and you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to the kids. They're never talking to you. Everybody have to be seen and it's so important. And you have to feel it right away when you're small. And we work with Arakia Milla in the kindergarten, and that's so important to listen to the voice there. And they say, the Arakia Milla, the kids have a hundred voice when they are born, but they end up with the one because they're always putting it into some boxes. And, you know, I can tell you one story from the job. We were uh, working for three weeks, uh, just walking around, they take a picture and listen to their games and, because our school is new, we have a lot more coming to open up the new swimming pool. And we have uh, one project for the swimming pool. But we did not know what they were most interested in. They were, the mayor was coming and he was opening the swimming pool and they were talking about, oh, he must be really, really rich. He owned all the swimming pool in the city. He's coming here and owned all the swimming pool, but you know, we paid with our taxes, so we owned it. <laughs> by ourselves, he doesn't own it, but in their mind, he was so important person, and we, we documented, and we sent it to him, Dagur, and he really loved the story, because they thought he, he was the owner of the swimming pool, and they make sculpture of him, open the swimming pool, because that was really important for them. You know, nobody adult was thinking about that, <laughs> but in their mind, there was really really important and we have a lot of we try to when we start to work with the project we maybe have some themes but we listen and take a walk and let them look at the computer the books and we think we are listening maybe for three to four weeks before we start to have them choose groups where they want to do, and we go to the art museum, we ask parents to come in and help us if they are interested in something. Like now one group are really interested with teeth, so we were thinking about having a dentist, and if you know parents who are working with something, we talk to them and have them help us. So yeah, we work for like six to eight weeks in one project. And they go really deep, and and do lots of research, even they're really young. 
And we are also music school in the kindergarten. We sing every morning and we sing two to three times over the day. We always start the morning with a little song and the fruit before we go to our, our things to work with. And we go over what day is today and we sing about it. And, and we also are in the project, Sim is for five years old kids in the uh, Reykjavik, the festival. So the five years old end up having a concert in Harpa for the parents. So we have been practicing that for, for January, is, is in Mars, isn't it? Yeah. Around Mars, April, beginning of that month. And we always end up singing in Harpa with lots of another school, lots of school in Reykjavik take part of this project. And we sing also sometimes with the first class and they have a music lesson in the flu. Everybody in second class have a music lesson in the flu. And that's free for the parents. They don't even have to pay extra for that. And we have a workshop and we have always the same workshop at the school, but we work a different, you know, and we have the same theme. But for one theme, there can be so many other themes where the kids are interested in. Johanna, but sir, we, we are working now with, we are working with the songs and you are... And uh, some sustainable. Yeah. Sustainability. Yeah. Sustainability. Sustainability, we are working with that theme now. But we have been working in the kindergarten with the, with the song who was, we are singing for the harpa, for the oldest one. And they have been figured out so many things to work from that, even fish, from teeth to fish. They were taking something out from the, from the letters and the writing. And here you can see the picture from the kids and of some themes. They have make their own costumes and having lots of fun outside. And we are really lucky because we are in the end of the city. So we have so beautiful natures all around and we work with that a lot. We go out for working every day with our own group for outdoor teaching in the kindergarten. We also have outdoor te teaching for the older one. And we stay out, we are, go around nine, even it's a little dark <laughs> and we are, back uh, around 11 with the kids. So they take a walk and we always see something new to work with in the nature. And this is our classroom. They are really beautiful and open spaces. And this is a new building. So we are really proud of it. Do we want to add something about the classroom, Johanna? Uh, well, I can. At one thing, I can add one thing because you know, every school go through some obstacles, you know, and because we are a growing school, of course we have obstacles mm -hmm. too. Uh, we are getting too many in the classroom, and the classrooms are getting a little bit too noisy, so we are splitting our groups up. We were all together, you know, but now due to this problem of too many students, we are splitting up our groups. But I think that's just. Uh, it will, just, it will just be a period, if you understand me. We are growing, mm. but then we, we will settle down again. So it's not a problem, it's just a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the last. Yeah. This is the last one. Thank you so much for having us. It was so wonderful to come here in this beautiful city.